Good afternoon. We have health and wellbeing questions. Question number one, Kevin Stewart. What recent progress has been made on rolling out insulin pumps to people with diabetes? Minister Michael Matheson. Our target to ensure 25% of children and young people have access to insulin pump therapy is due to be reported on after March 2013. While it's clear that good progress has been made in a number of areas, we are disappointed that some boards have not met the target by, uh, will not meet the target by the end of March 2013. We remain determined that boards continue to work towards this rightly ambitious target and ensure that equal access to pumps across Scotland is available. We are working closely with boards to ensure that they have plans in place to achieve the target safely. Kevin Stewart. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, given the understandable shortage of staff to carry a, a, out insulin pump training in Grampian, uh, will the Minister consider issuing guidelines to allow trained representatives from the company supplying the pumps to help roll out the pumps to patients who require them? Minister. Well, and the work which we have undertaken with boards over the last uh, year and a half is to make sure that they have an increasing level of capacity amongst their staff who can support uh, patients moving on to insulin uh, therapy. I understand that NHS uh, Grampian have a service level agreement in place with a uh, uh, insulin pump provider to help to support the training and also to provide advice to adults that are moving on to uh, insulin pumps. However, it is more complex in the paediatric sector where there has to be a much more integrated approach across a number of services from education, health service and from uh, families and carers which make it uh, more difficult. However, I understand that NHS Grampian are continuing to look at what further measures they can take in order to build on the existing capacity they have around staffing levels to support patients in moving on to uh, uh, insulin pumps or in getting further advice on them. David Stewart. Uh, the, officer, the Minister will be aware of my interest in diabetes as co-convener of the cross-party group. I agree with the Scottish Government's targets for under-18 rules and to triple pr provision of pumps for all ages over the next three years. However, how will the Minister tackle the postcode lottery where some laggard health boards are simply not performing and will not make the first targets by the end of this month? Minister. Uh, I recognise Mr Stewart's long-standing interest in this particular uh, issue, and he's right in recognising that this is a, a target which is not only just about improving uh, the way in which uh, insulin pumps are provided, but improving the way in which services are, for those with diabetes are improved uh, also. Uh, I also share his disappointment that there have been a number of boards who have not made the progress that I would expect. For example, NHS Highland in his own constituency area. I think their performance in this area has, is unacceptable and that both the Chair and the Chief Executive need to show much clearer leadership in making sure that they take forward this ambitious target much more effectively. What we are doing is working with them to make sure that they have adequate plans in place locally to make sure that they increase provision of insulin pumps within their own area. And we have asked them to report to us on a monthly basis on how they are continuing to build on that progress over the months to come. Question number two, Graham Day. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what importance it places on the delivery of health services in rural locations. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I place great emphasis on the need to ensure sustainable healthcare services in remote and rural areas. And I recently announced that NHS Highland will develop and test models of healthcare delivery in remote and rural areas. Graham Day. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer, but uh, the residents of Wetham and my constituency have been pressing for GP provision within the village since early 2011. A forward based practice has confirmed a willingness to set up a satellite operation, and the Angus Community Health Partnership, partnership is to progress a business plan. But the Cabinet Secretary will, I'm sure, understand the frustration felt locally that after two years still nothing definitive has happened. Will he join me in encouraging NHS Tayside to now treat this as a matter of urgency? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I'm happy to do so, and I can confirm that Angus Community Health Partnership has been working closely with Latham residents on this issue. They're also in dialogue with the local for for practice, as Mr Day has said, with a view to extending the service provision already delivered to Latham residents by independent contractor GPs. It's anticipated that services will be developed 
as quickly as possible, subject to the satisfactory conclusion to ongoing negotiations. And I will certainly do what I can to encourage all sides to reach a quick conclusion. Buda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware about the, of the challenges in providing GP cover in Mali, Gaharakal and the Small Isles, and indeed finding a permanent GP for Applecross. Can I ask what steps he's taking to ensure that health boards that cover remote and rural communities have the finance and resources to help them recruit and retain GPs in these areas, and that co contracts and support is attractive enough to make those positions um, attractive to possible candidates? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I have to say, generally speaking, the issue is not so much the availability of resources, it's really other factors about recruiting and retaining GPs in rural areas, particularly remoter and island communities. And that's why, for example, in the Ardnamurchan Peninsula, three practices have come together to form one practice, uh, because that will allow them, for example, every GP only to have to work one weekend in eight instead of one weekend in two. And there are a range of other factors that influence the recruitment and retention of GPs in rural areas, and we are addressing those, and we are looking at different models in different parts of the country, particularly in the Highlands, to look at what works best in particular situations. Uh, one, of, one of the areas in, in Grampian, for example, one of the ways in which they attract and retain GPs is by extensive use of GPs with special interests. Uh, so that I was up in Turriff two weeks ago in the Turriff Hospital and uh, there was GPs working in there. For example, one had a special interest in ultrasound technology and was examining people using ultrasound. And I asked her, was that one of the reasons she stayed, the ability to develop those other interests? And she said, absolutely. So there are different ways to tackle this problem, but tackle it we must. Question number three, Mark MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government how it ensures that people with acquired brain injuries receive appropriate treatment. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, it is thought that acquired brain injury is the most common cause of disability in working age adults, which can require treatment and care for a complex range of needs. For many people, the effects of ABI will often be lifelong. The emphasis on treatment will be through a multidisciplinary approach involving a wide range of services from different specialities, including accident and emergency, general surgery, orthopaedic surgery, neurosurgery, neurorehabilitation and psychiatric services. We understand that coordination of care for such complex needs is challenging, and we've supported the development of the National Managed Clinical Network for ABI. This national network works to promote consistency of treatment across Scotland and improve the quality of services for children and adults with ABI. Mark MacDonald. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. I recently visited Momentum in Aberdeen who work with individuals who have an acquired brain injury. One of the concerns raised was that individuals with acquired brain injury often find it difficult to access appropriate support as they often fall between the two stools of learning disabilities and mental health services. Can the Cabinet Secretary look into what can be done to ensure appropriate treatment and support pathways are available for individuals with acquired brain injury? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, as I mentioned previously, the National Managed Clinical Network for EBI works to promote consistency of treatment across Scotland and improve the quality of services for children and adults with ABI. In 2009, the network published its standards for traumatic brain injuries in adults, which covers a number of areas which are available on their website, and I would be happy to provide the member with the detail on this. Whilst the standards have been developed for TBI, many of the recommendations are equally applicable to ABI. The network is exploring the potential to evolve into a managed care network which will help support and recognise the long-term social care needs for people with ABI. I understand this work is in its early stages and will take time. However, it is envisaged the network will include developing pathways between health and social care to deal with the very issues highlighted rightly by Mark MacDonald. And the work will be helped by the recently published Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network Sign Guideline 130 on brain injury rehabilitation in adults. Richard Simpson. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that comprehensive answer on, that, on the specific thing of brain injury. One form of brain injury is alcohol-related brain damage, uh, and there was a specialist working group on that particular area, which is one of intensive uh, uh, NHS uh, demand and increasing NHS demand. And I wonder if he could uh, give us an indication as to whether there's been progress on the recommendations of that group, or he could provide a report at a later date to Parliament, because it is an important area. 
Secretary. Presiding officer, the work of the group is fairly detailed, so it's maybe best if I write to Dr Simpson and place a copy of the letter in SPICE so that every member has access to it. Question number four, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it has made of the health benefits of access to green space. Minister Michael Matheson. Uh, the Scottish Government funded the Green Health Project to look at the health benefits of access to green space building on the existing evidence base. Uh, the project uh, found that more green space in urban neighbourhoods is associated with a lower risk of mortality amongst Scotland's poorest men. Amongst middle-aged Scots who were not in work and lived in the most deprived urban areas, the research also found healthier levels of the stress hormone cortisol amongst those who had green space in their neighbourhoods compared to those with less. Furthermore, the project found that Scots who use green spaces for physical activity have a lower risk of poor mental health than those who uh, use non-natural environments such as the gym and streets. Claire Adamson. His answer. Um, uh, I would like to draw his attention to the pioneering work in Forth Valley Royal Hospital in my region, where a local partnership working in the surrounding woodlands has created a green oasis for patients, which aids in their recuperation and stress. It's available for staff and visitors and for the local community, and can ask whether the Minister will ensure that this good practice is shared across the NHS estate. Minister. Um, I am very aware of the project that uh, Claire Aronson refers to as the uh, Fort Valley Royal Hospital is based on my own constituency. Um, it's a hospital site which to some degree is uh, fairly unique uh, because it's the old Royal Scottish National Hospital site and has an extensive woodland and grassland area uh, associated with it and have been able to make good use of that uh, for, the benefits of, uh, for the benefit of patients uh, and for, uh, for relatives also. Um, we have taken forward a number of uh, areas of work in this area at a national level through the uh, Green Exercise Partnership, which is a, a combination of the Forestry Commission uh, in Scotland, Scottish Natural Heritage and NHS Health Scotland, uh, to look at what further programmes could be used to improve NHS healthcare green space settings. Uh, and they are working with eight area health boards in Scotland to help to support them in collaborating around how they can improve the use of their uh, green spaces uh, within the local hospital area. Alongside that, there is a lot of evidence that shows there are real benefits that can be used or be gained from social prescribing through GP practices and referring patients on to uh, different activities which are based in green space areas, uh, which is a way in which primary care can also help to make use of local green spaces in an effective way that can help to improve someone's health and wellbeing. Question number five in the name of Dave Thompson has been withdrawn for understandable reasons. Question number six, Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many adults in the NHS Orkney area are on a waiting list to be registered with an NHS dentist. Minister Michael Matheson. At responsibility for the overall provision of NHS general dental services in the area rests with NHS Orkney. As at the 14th of March 2013, there are 1,093 adults waiting to register with an NHS dentist within the NHS Orkney area. Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you. And can I thank the uh, Minister for that response and for his engagement on this issue over uh, a number of months now. Um, I, I certainly welcome the fact that progress uh, has been made over recent times, uh, but as I'm sure the Minister will acknowledge, adult registrations in Orkney with an NHS dentist and participation rates remain far below the national uh, average. Can I therefore urge him to look at what specific steps can be taken to ensure adults in my constituency uh, enjoy the same access to NHS uh, dental treatment as those enjoyed by uh, others across Scotland? Minister. Um, can I thank the member for his question? This is an issue which we have had uh, a considerable level of contact on over the last uh, year or so. And uh, it is fair to say, as the member recognises, that NHS Orkney have made uh, significant progress in this area. As I mentioned, it is uh, 1,093 adults waiting to register with an NHS dentist at the present moment. This compares to uh, uh, the, the figure for July 2012, where uh, it was uh, 2,120. It is almost a 50% reduction has taken place over a relatively small period of time, but I do recognise that there is further progress that needs to be made in this area. I understand from NHS Orkney uh, that they have uh, two permanent uh, dental officers 
uh, posts uh, which are presently vacant and they're about to advertise uh, for replacements and that they also have a temporary post which is presently vacant which I understand they're also hoping to recruit into. I've also asked the Chief Dental Officer to uh, maintain contact with NHS Orkney to ensure that they are getting the right support and advice that's necessary uh, to continue to make progress in this area. And the last report I had from the Chief Dental Officer was that the, the Board were confident that they were moving in the right direction uh, and that should they require any further support from uh, the central government point of view, uh, that they would request that. But I have asked them to keep us informed on the progress that they are making so that we can continue to see the improvements that have been made further made within NHS Orton area. Question number seven in the name of Helen Needy has been withdrawn. Mrs Needy is representing the Parliament on other business. Question number eight in the name of David Torrance has not been lodged um, for perfectly understandable reasons. Question number nine, Roderick Campbell. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to encourage the use of so-called talking therapies across the NHS. Minister Michael Matheson. Uh, the Scottish Government has established the uh, heat target for delivering faster access to mental health services by uh, delivering 18-week referral to treatment for psychological therapies from December 2014. Uh, we have already made improvements in service performance across Scotland since the heat target was set. Uh, and the target is acting as a driver uh, for service improvement. We have published the matrix, a guide to uh, delivering evidence-based psychological therapies in Scotland on what treatments are effective for which conditions. Uh, the matrix also stresses that services must provide adequate supervision to staff delivering psychological interventions to ensure patient safety and the delivery of evidence-based care. Through NHS Education Scotland, we are working to assess and develop workforce capacity to ensure that a range of staff are equipped to deliver these therapies. Roderick Campbell. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer and I welcome the role that psychological therapy plays in the Scottish Government's mental health strategy for 2012-15. But does the Minister accept, however, that at the moment fewer than 1% of elderly patients with depression are referred to psychological services and more often than not are prescribed medication? What steps can the Scottish Government take to improve these figures? Minister. Um, well, I think the member raises a very important point because uh, more than any group, uh, older people are less likely to have uh, mental illness diagnosed and less likely to receive treatment, although some prescribing data would suggest that this is improving. Uh, delivery of the psychological therapies heat target uh, applies to older people in the same way it applies to the rest of the population uh, and will be monitoring progress on this. Uh, we also established a working group to focus on the psychological needs of older people uh, and the group identified the need to improve uh, uh, access to services across uh, the whole of the uh, mental health system. Uh, we are working with NHS boards and other partners uh, to take forward these recommendations uh, and to develop outcome measures related to older people's mental uh, health. Some local authority areas um, are taking this work forward also uh, through service redesign uh, under the Change Fund and NHS Education for Scotland uh, is delivering uh, training to NHS staff uh, on psychological interventions for older people, including uh, uh, training a cohort of older people CBT uh, therapists. So there's a range of measures uh, which I believe can help us to assist in improving the way in which services are delivered to older people with uh, uh, mental illness and we will monitor that as we move forward uh, towards achieving the heat target in December 2014. Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, the Minister knows that the issue of psychological therapies for older people was discussed at the last but one meeting of the cross-party group on mental health, but has he heard that at the last meeting uh, we were presented with quite a lot of uh, evidence about the, the, the range of psychological therapies that uh, could be uh, beneficial for uh, a whole variety of uh, people uh, of different ages across Scotland. In particular, uh, does he understand the concern that was expressed that for many NHS boards, psychological therapies are identified with cognitive behavioural therapy? And useful as that therapy is, uh, can he do anything to extend the range of therapies that were available? Because we were told that there was a sound evidence base for a whole range of humanistic psychotherapies and counselling. Minister. Well, I do recognise the very issue that the member uh, raises. That's why we published the matrix, which takes forward and presents a range of different psychological therapies that can be used and 
where they can uh, best be applied. It is extremely important that we do have a good evidence base to any psychological therapies that are being made available uh, with any NHS Scotland. Uh, we are always open to looking at where there are other therapies that can be provided where there is a good evidence base and they can be included uh, within uh, the matrix. And that has been looked at uh, prior to that was looked at prior to the publication of the, uh, uh, the matrix uh, last year. It is important, though, that we make sure uh, that people are able to access these services in a way uh, that best suits them also. And that's why it's important that in delivering these services, uh, that local authorities and health boards work in partnership to design services that allow older people to get as best access to these services as and when it's appropriate to them. Richard Simpson. Can I, uh, presiding officer, recognise the, the constraints on the government of the workforce situation with regard to talking therapies and the progress they've made and the aspirations that they have? But in trying to achieve a, a December 2014 target, can I draw to their attention the fact that I have a constituent who has been referred recently for psychological services to Tayside and has been told they will wait three years. Now, as this target of 18 weeks approaches, I hope that they will look at the existing waiting lists and make sure that individuals are not going to have an extended period of time but will, in fact, benefit from the government's aspirations uh, to ensure an 18-week waiting time. Minister. Well, the very waiting time that the member has raised of, uh, for his own constituent is unacceptable, and that's why the target was brought in in order to drive forward improvement in this particular area. It is worth uh, noting that uh, I understand it's the only target of its nature in the world for access to psychological therapies. And I recognise that it's very ambitious, but we need to make sure that we have a target that can help to improve the way in which services are delivered and that we can drive up standards and speed up access to these particular uh, therapies. Some of the work we're doing just now is to make sure that boards are recording this information in a consistent way, because the reality is some boards have not been recording this type of information and we need to make sure that the quality of that data is good so that we can have confidence in the progress that boards are making and that we can then actually publish that data so that people can have an informed, some informed information around how different boards are performing in this area. So it is a target which I do recognise is ambitious, but is one which I think can actually help to improve the way in which services are delivered overall in this area. Bruce Crawford. Thank you, Mr. Officer. I know the Minister will understand that these particular services that provide valuable speech and communication services to children and their families, and, and particularly in the nursery areas, are of great socio-economic advantage. Will you share my disappointment in that case that the, the Labour and Tory administration in Stirling Council area have just recently withdrawn some services to an organisation called CHAT, and that is having a significant impact on my constituents? Minister. Well, I am aware that uh, some services around uh, communication skills at an early age, such as through speech therapy, etc., can help to address what can become uh, more difficult communication disorders in later life, which can lead to, lead to a whole range of different issues. And that type of early intervention approach is absolutely crucial uh, in tackling some of these uh, issues much more effectively. And it's important that all local authorities look at taking a much more preventative approach around these measures and the best way in which they can go about achieving that is through early intervention, and they should be looking to support services to allow that to happen effectively within their area. Question number 10, Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it plans to improve services for people with neurological conditions and their carers. Minister Michael Matheson. Uh, we are committed to ensuring that everyone with a neurological condition is able to access the care and support they need. Uh, this includes support for their families and carers. The National Neurological Advisory Group has been established with the uh, Scottish Government funding to support implementation of the clinical standards for neurological conditions and has reported that all boards now have improvement plans and impl improvement leads in place and are providing reports on progress. Uh, prior to this, uh, the Scottish Government provided NHS boards with uh, funding of around £1.2 million over two years to assist them in developing local neurological improvement networks. Mary Fee. I thank the Minister, <coughs> excuse me, I thank the Minister for his answer. People with neurological conditions are often at the mercy of a postcode lottery. Can I ask the Minister what steps the Government are taking to tackle this postcode lottery in terms of care for people with neurological conditions? Minister. 
Well, uh, some of the work that I mentioned in my uh, response around the uh, National Neurological Advisory Group in helping to support the implementation of the clinical standards is to help to address some of these very inconsistencies that Mary Fee uh, recognises. And that's why each board was asked to bring forward a, an improvement uh, plan and to also to put in place improvement leads that can allow that to happen in a consistent way. I recognise that there will continue to be some inconsistencies in the way in which boards are taking this forward. But what we now have is infrastructure in place that can assist us in making sure that there is a much more consistent way in the way in which, low, uh, which health boards are taking this area um, of work forward. Some of the feedback I have heard uh, from some organisations is that they are starting to see uh, some improvements that are coming about as a result of these uh, improvements. But I recognise that there is further progress to be made in this, and I will be keen to see that progress continue. Question 11, Ken McIntosh. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government when it will launch its consultation on the use and administration of the resource that it will receive as a result of the UK Government's decision to close the Independent Living Fund in 2015. Minister Michael Matheson. Uh, this spring, uh, the Scottish Government will launch a consultation on the future use of the resources that will be devolved under Westminster's decision to close the Independent Living Fund. Ken Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Minister if he's able to indicate uh, his thinking at this stage on the Scottish Government's intention for the fund and the consultation questions, including on whether or not it will be open to new applicants? If he's not able to answer that question, can he at least give us the uh, fundamental assurance that the consultation starts on the premise that no current recipients of the ILF will be disadvantaged? In other words, that no one who currently receives ILF will lose it. Minister. Well, the member is inviting me to give a commitment on the basis of information I don't have as yet from the Westminster Government on exactly what level of resource will actually be devolved to uh, the Scottish Government. Once we have some of that information, we will be in a better place uh, to then be able to take forward uh, what may be the appropriate measures here in Scotland. What I do recognise is that many disability organisations were extremely disappointed by the way in which the UK Government took forward the consultation on uh, its decision to close the Independent Living Fund. And I'm, uh, I can give a commitment to the Chamber that the consultation which we will take forward here in Scotland will be a genuine one where we will be seeking people's views on what may be the best approach in Scotland. However, that will be largely dependent upon the level of resource that is devolved to the Scottish Government by the UK Government. And as yet, we don't have that detail confirmed. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. Minister, as you know, all SNP MSPs deplore the changes being imposed by the UK Government. Is it not the case, though, that three days before the 2010 general election, changes brought in by the then UK Labour Government to the qualifying criteria were implemented such that of the 3,660 people in Scotland receiving ILF, only 16 would qualify if they were to reapply, and therefore one of the last actions of the last Labour Government was to effectively close the ILF to new applicants? Minister. I know that a number of changes have been made to uh, the ILF fund over uh, several years, which started with the previous government has continued with the existing government. But we are in a situation where uh, the UK government have made a decision that they wish to uh, bring the independent living fund to an end, which I recognise causes uncertainty and anxiety uh, for those uh, who are presently recipients of its funding. Uh, I'm keen to try and take forward in a a genuine, open and transparent way, a consultation with stakeholders that can allow them to express their views about what future plans we can take forward here in Scotland. However, I do again uh, issue a note of caution in that we are not aware of the exact level of finance that will be devolved by uh, the UK Government to the Scottish Government, which will have a significant bearing on any future plans we have here in Scotland. But there is a willingness on the part of the Scottish Government to engage with stakeholders in a genuine way to allow them to express their views on what the future shape of any service should be like in Scotland. Question number 12, in the name of Patricia Ferguson, has been withdrawn. Question number 13, Michael McMahon. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on how NHS boards apply the Liverpool Care Pathway. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government's position is that any organisation caring for dying people should be able to demonstrate best practice in care of the dying. The Liverpool Care Pathway is recognised as one pathway that NHS boards can use to support high-quality end-of-life care. The responsibility for use and monitoring of the Liverpool Care Pathway lies with the organisation using it. 
The use of the Liverpool Care Pathway should be part of a continuous quality improvement programme within an organisation's governance structure and must be supported by a robust education and training programme. Michael McMahon. I thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, for his response. But the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of recent press reports which have painted a very negative uh, picture of the Liverpool Care Pathway. And while it is always concerning when families are left uh, upset following the loss of a loved one and when the care they received is considered to have been unsatisfactory, but would the Cabinet Secretary agree that overall the application of the Liverpool Care Pathway has a good record and that its use is a positive care package in end-of-life situations? Will the Cabinet Secretary therefore commit to working with practitioners in the hospice and palliative care sector to promote the LCP and to support public education on what the LCP can be in order to overcome the negative perceptions which may have been promoted by some in the media? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I wholly agree with the sentiments expressed by Michael McMahon and I am prepared to work with all the relevant stakeholders to try to ensure that the reputation of the Liverpool uh, care pathway is enhanced uh, as it should be. Uh, obviously, from time to time, you do get levels of dissatisfaction with patients about particular uh, examples and their carers and family about particular issues. And I would draw the Chamber's attention, presiding officer, to the patient opinion website I launched yesterday, uh, whereby any patient or carer or family member or visitor will be able to record any concerns, which can then immediately be brought to the attention of ministers by patient opinion who are administering this site, either in relation to the Liverpool care pathway or indeed to any matter uh, that they are concerned about in relation to service provision in the National Health Service. Annette Milne. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary's response to, to uh, Michael McMahon. Um, he will recall that I wrote to him in November last year asking him what discussions he has had with the Department of Health in relation to their inquiry into the Liverpool Care Pathway. Can he take this opportunity to inform members of what progress has been made in explaining to the wider public the benefits of this form of palliative care? But would he perhaps agree with me that the term Liverpool Care Pathway is no longer helpful given the, the misguided connections it now has, as referred to by Michael McMahon? Cabinet Secretary. Well, well, I think both north and south of the border, this is very much work in progress because we do recognise that, um, as I said in my first answer, there is a major education and training programme to be undertaken. And part of that is communicating with public, with patients, with carers, with family. And I do know of incidents, indeed, I think there was one case recently highlighted at the cross-party group on palliative care, where a patient who was having Liverpool Care Pathway administered, the family did express a number of concerns, and those concerns were primarily around the lack, as they perceived it, of proper communication with the family. So I don't think there's any silver bullet in this. I think it's ongoing education and training that is required at all levels. Uh, but I think, uh, undoubtedly, the job of all of us is to reassure people that the Liverpool Care Pathway, properly administered, is a very acceptable pathway in the circumstances. Question 14, Rob Gibson. I give the officer to ask the Scottish Government what action the Scottish Ambulance Service takes to meet patients' travel and emergency needs in Caithness. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, the Scottish Ambulance Service are responsible for providing the patients of Caithness and all other parts of Scotland with high quality, safe, effective and compassionate care. The Scottish Ambulance Service are responsible for the delivery of the 999 Emergency Ambulance Service, the Air Ambulance Service and the Non-Emergency Patient Transport Service for those patients who have a medical or mobility need for the support of an ambulance crew to access their healthcare appointment. I expect the Scottish Ambulance Service to work in partnership with the communities they support to ensure they meet the needs, uh, their needs in a way that is underpinned by the NHS Scotland Healthcare Quality Strategy. Bob Gibson. Thank the Minister for that answer. I wonder if he could provide a comparison of costs of patient transport to and from, Ka uh, from Caithness to Ragmore Hospital in Inverness, in contrast to providing more services in Caithness General Hospital in Wick and the Dunbar Hospital in Thurso. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I would be more than happy to provide uh, that information and indeed to have a meeting with Mr Gibson to discuss the various issues. Can I draw attention uh, to a very comparable situation uh, that I saw for myself last week in Inverness in terms of a mental health consultation held 
from Brigmore Hospital, where the mental health consultant was, with a patient who was a resident of a care home in Balahulish. And it's a very, very good example of where telecare services can also be extremely helpful. And we've given high priority to the development of telecare services, particularly in the Highlands and Grampian and uh, Island areas in Scotland, where it can make transport unnecessary without in any way diminishing, indeed improving the quality of care. Because one of the points made to me by that particular patient and their carers and family was the, the fact that they did not need to make a five hour round journey between Balahulish and Inverness in itself was of major benefit to the patient and meant the stress of that journey, which would be quite extreme in this case, was avoided. But I'm more than happy to discuss the particular issues around, in, uh, around Case Nays with Mr Gibson. Question number 15, Fiona MacLeod. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when the Scotland route of the Queen's baton relay will be announced. Minister Shona Robertson. On Commonwealth Day, the 11th of March this year, the route that the Queen's Baton Relay will take around the Commonwealth was announced. When the Baton arrives in Scotland in mid-June next year, it will spend 40 days travelling around every part of Scotland, visiting every local authority area. The relay will finish at the Commonwealth Games opening ceremony in Glasgow on the 23rd of July. The Glasgow 2014 Organising Committee is working with the Scottish Government, local authorities and others to develop the route that the Queen's Baton Relay will take as it travels around Scotland. And that route will be announced in October this year. As the Baton travels around the country, it will provide a fantastic opportunity for people and communities across the whole of Scotland to take part in celebrating the Games. Fiona MacLeod. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? And can I also ask the Minister if local people would be prioritised to carry the Baton in their hometown and whether there will be any costs be involved for the participants in this? Now, both my questions arise from experiences of constituents as Olympic torchbearers which left some of them out of pocket and others many miles from home. They still enjoyed the experience, but I'm hoping that we can learn from that. Minister? Uh, well, I can certainly tell uh, Fiona MacLeod that we have been working very hard to learn the lessons from the Olympic torch relay. Um, I can tell her that for the Queen's Baton Relay, the organising committee has committed as far as is operationally possible to enable baton bearers to run in their local area. Uh, I can also tell her that there are no fees associated with being a baton bearer and those fortunate to be selected will have a tremendous opportunity to contribute towards what will be a great spectacle and excitement of the Games coming to Scotland. Question 16, Mike McKenzie. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made since 2007 in delivering health care to rural and remote areas. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, the Remote and Rural Implementation Group, which oversaw the implementation of the Scottish Government's report delivering for remote and rural health care, was disbanded in 2010, and the final report confirms that 63 recommendations had been delivered. <laughs> the North of Scotland Planning Group continues to provide support to delivering sustainable remote and rural health care in that part of Scotland. Mike McKenzie. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and wonder if he agrees with me that, uh, given the progress made in delivering better health services across rural Scotland, um, does that highlight uh, that this Parliament is perhaps best placed to meet the needs of rural and remote Scotland across all policy areas? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I couldn't agree more. Uh, indeed, having listened to the budget before I come in here, Having listened to the budget before I come in here, I'm even more confirmed in my view that it's far better for Scotland to have full control over all aspects of governance of Scotland. We can take question 17 of everybody is brief. John Wilson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met the Chief Executive of NHS Lanarkshire and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary, brief. Presiding Officer, both Ministers and Government officials regularly meet with NHS boards, including NHS Lanarkshire, and a range of matters of importance to local people are discussed. John Wilson. 
Thank you, Minister, sorry, Cabinet Secretary. It has been brought to my attention that some of my constituents face the inconvenience of having to travel to a centralised X-ray service in Monklands Hospital rather than the service which was previously provided at Coatbridge and Cumbernauld Health Centres. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise me on what impact the centralisation of X-ray services in Monklands Hospital has had on patients' attendance at Monklands Hospital X-ray department and whether the Monklands Hospital is able to cope with the demand made by centralising the service? And my apologies. Cabinet Secretary, briefly, please. Presiding officer, I'm very much aware of the issues. My colleague and uh, John Wilson's colleague, Jamie Hepburn, has raised this on a number of occasions. I'm monitoring the situation very closely to make sure that the capacity at Monklands is satisfactory to cover both Coatbridge and Cumbernauld and to ensure the quality of the services is in no way diminished as a result of its relocation last year. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. We now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 5988 in the name of Keith Brown.